I want to thank all the faculty and graduate students, all the graduate students who were hosts to the uh, graduate uh, recruits uh, for all the work that you did, meeting with people um, um, and participating in all the events yesterday and today. I hope the two days were exciting for everyone. Um, I heard it from a couple of people. Um, um, and uh, I hope the guests had a good time here. Thank you for uh, being um, these two days with us here. Um, and uh, after the colloquium today, um, we are going to have a, a, a dinner. It's uh, going to be on campus. Uh, it's in Palmer Commons. Uh, some people know where it is. Um, others who don't, Palmer Commons, uh, as you leave this building, if you go uh, in the walkway between the School of Dentistry and the Museum of Natural History, going through that path, you're gonna get to the ground floor, um, to the floor where uh, um, um, the location of the dinner is going to be. Um, and this is in Palmer Commons in the Windows Lounge Cafe. It's on the third floor of the building, but walking there, I'm gonna go walk into the ground floor, okay? Um, I'm gonna pass it to Professor Barbara Meek, uh, Professor of Anthropology and Linguistics, who's going to do the introduction of the colloquium. Barbara Meek is also the Associate Dean for Social Sciences in the College of LSME. Thank you. Thank you, Akisha. All right, I hear that I get to begin the next part of the event by reading, uh oh, a land acknowledgement. Oh, I read the house rules, okay. Oh, the down arrow's not working. Okay, house rules. Closed captioning is available via real-time human, oh, human transcription. Uh, to enable captions, click the CC button located at the bottom of the screen. I can never find it. Good luck. Um, question period will be conducted using the hand raising function as much as possible. Alternatively, if you cannot or prefer not to unmute, please use the Q&A function to type in your question. Then to ask a question, click the raise hand button located at the bottom of the screen, wait for your name to be called and you will be promoted to panelist and will be able to unmute yourself. And if you are comfortable with it, turn on your video. And if you have any technical issues, send it through the chat. Thank you. Okay. The slide is not moving. So use the mouth. Thank you. Okay, so the Department of Linguistics recognizes the University of Michigan's origins in a land grant from the Anishinaabe, including Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi and Wendat nations. The university continues to exist on the historical territorial land of Anishinaabe people and other indigenous people who are passing through. Adawa, Ojibwe, and Padawatomi are collectively called Anishinaabemowin and belong to the Algonquian language family. These are currently, or there are currently 12 recognized Anishinaabe tribes in the state of Michigan and many Anishinaabe people living throughout the state and interacting at the University of Michigan. Um, nice, thank you. Okay. Moving on to introducing our speaker today. So I want to start by saying Marawaika, um, which means hello and welcome in Comanche, my heritage language. So our speaker today, whose um, tribal affiliation is Sault Ste. Marie, is Dr. Cherry Meyer. She is an Ojibwe linguist who specializes in the morphosemantics of Anishinaabe Algonquian languages. She is also a passionate advocate for indigenous language documentation and language revitalization from empowering Ojibwe speakers and teachers on the ground through the work that she's been doing for her research and beyond, as well as organizing panels and conferences in celebration of the year and now the decade of indigenous languages. She received her BA in linguistics and Spanish from Wayne State and her PhD from the University of Chicago 
working closely with Amy Dahlstrom and Sadiko Komufuene. Her dissertation investigated noun categorization in the Michigan variety of Ojibwe, focusing on classifier relations and gender and animacy. And I think we will hear some about some of that today. She started at U of M as a postdoctoral fellow and began as an assistant professor in linguistics and American culture this past fall. So congratulations. Along with her LSA Collegiate Fellowship, she's earned several awards, such as an American Philosophical Society Phillips Fund Award for her research, a Colang Endangered Language Fund Fellowship. So that is like the premier summer program for learning how to do documentation and work with indigenous communities. And she was also a Ronald McNair Scholar. She has several forthcoming publications and many already in print. Many of those are part of the Algonquian Conference Proceedings. She has also helped edit a Chicago Linguistic Society proceeding and has given presentations at several of these sort of um, aerially focused conferences as well as at the Society for the Study of Indigenous Languages and the Linguistic Society of Association annual meetings. Her talk today is titled Exceptional Animates in Ojibwe, the link between gender and classifiers. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Cherry Meyer. Okay, got my mic on, so I think we're just about ready to go. I did that too soon. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Okay. So can I use, I can probably use this guy. Okay. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about exceptional animates in Ojibwe, the link between gender and classifiers. This is mostly my dissertation research. Um, and I'm very excited to share it with all of you today. So without Further ado, this is an outline for our talk today. First, I'll present a question and proposal. We'll take a step back and talk broadly about what noun categorization is. And then we'll move on to grammatical gender and classifiers. And we'll talk about the link between those two and discuss some further considerations because language sometimes is a little wonky and it doesn't always act the way you think it will. Um, and then we'll have our conclusion. So in Ojibwe, the grammatical gender, oh, excuse me, I want to take a step back and say, Ani Bojo Minogijigat, Wigwasman Indijinakaz, Bawating and Dojiba. I'm Cherry Meyer. Um, my people are from Sault Ste. Marie. And it's a good day today. I'm very happy to have all of you here. Thank you. Um, so in Ojibwe, the grammatical gender of a noun is mostly predictable. Nouns with animate meanings are assigned to the animate gender. Nouns with inanimate meanings are assigned to the inanimate gender, mostly. So we have over here in one, some animate nouns with animate meanings, anini, man, ikwe, woman, makwa, bear. And in column two, we have inanimate nouns with inanimate meanings. Wabigwan, flower, ozid, his or her foot, weas, meat. But some nouns with inanimate meanings are in the animate gender. We do not get exceptions going the other way. We only have to deal with this right here. So this would be examples like we see in the third column over here, inanimate meaning, but animate gender. So there's a mismatch, if, uh, possibly, we'll see. Um, so we have things like mitig, tree, visab, nettle, asekan, tanned hide, skoman, raspberry, or asen stone. So the question that we want to answer is, is it possible to motivate inclusion in the animate gender along with nouns with meanings of humans and animals um, of such a disparate group of nouns as pipes, beads, kettles, grain products, tobacco, trees, drums, rocks, feathers, money, cars, and nets, and probably a few other categories I've left off of there. And can we do it in an elegant way? So my proposal is yes, we can. Nouns assigned to the animate gender value are those that number one, denote animate reference, totally expected. Two, 
denote animate reference that are semantically compatible with the set of sortal classifiers. We'll get into what that means. And three, nouns associated through semantic extension. Okay. So, Nimigwechi Wiag, I thank them. Many thanks to speakers Elizabeth and Leonard Kimmy Wan and my mentor Susan Asquith up at Sault Ste. Marie for teaching me about the language. Thanks are also due to the research assistants who contributed at various stages, various stages of the project, Anand Abram, Anna Whitney, and Garrett Johnson. Thank you very much. A little bit about the research methods. So the research for the gender analysis comes from the Ojibwe People's Dictionary, which is a super fantastic online resource. Um, and the research for the classifiers comes from fieldwork conducted with speakers from the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. So the gender analysis is, or the, the Ojibwe People's Dictionary is mainly the Southwestern dialect spoken in like Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, and for the classifiers, I worked with speakers who learned to speak in Wiklemekong. And so that's mostly what we call the Ottawa dialect or variety. Um, the main difference would be um, syncope, where some unstressed vowels get dropped. There are some very minor lexical and grammatical differences, but mostly it's in the way that things sound, or if you're watching a presentation, the way that the words look. Much more consonant clusters in the Ottawa and Eastern varieties. Um, but everything seems to hold across the gender and classifiers analysis that we're doing here. So we will discuss um, dialectal variation towards the end. So now we can take a step back and ask, what is noun categorization? Uh, why basically do gender and classifiers make sense? Why does it make sense to talk about them together? They're both types of noun categorization. So grammatical distinctions between the nouns of a language, which usually provides some clues to their meaning. So there are many different types of noun categorization across the world's languages, and a single language may have multiple types of noun categorization. Um, I just like to say there's a bit of terminal terminological multiplicity in the field right now. Some people say noun categorization, some say noun classification, some people call everything noun classes, some people call everything classifiers. So it gets a little confusing, but I will consistently use noun categorization. So what is a type of noun categorization in English? We have something called count and non-count nouns or uh, count and mass nouns. So these are things like chair or raindrop, and on the non-count side, we have snow and water. So the difference becomes really salient when we try to pluralize these things. So we can say chair and chairs and raindrop and raindrops, totally fine. But if you say snow and snows or water and waters, it doesn't simply mean plural snow and plural water. It has a different meaning. Uh, so like multiple snows over a big period of time, as opposed to having a lot of snow. Um, so you can't simply pluralize these in the English language. What are some types of noun categorization not found in English? Lots. We have uh, grammatical gender, classifiers, and noun classes in lots of other languages of the world, but not in English. And a particular type of noun categorization may be ubiquitous in one language and completely absent in another. So what are some types of noun categorization that we have in Ojibwe? Well, we have grammatical gender and classifiers, and we also have count and non-count nouns, but we're not going to talk about those today. We're going to focus on these first two here. So it's actually very rare to find both gender and classifiers in a single language. In fact, each one is correlated with a different morphological type. Uh, gender is usually found in fusional and agglutinating languages. These are called synthetic languages, which have a higher morpheme per word ratio. So a word will be composed of multiple morphemes. And classifiers are usually found at the opposite end of the spectrum in isolating languages, where one morpheme is one word. So you will not often get words that are composed of multiple morphemes. They have a lower morpheme per word ratio. Ojibwe is on the very, very high end of the morpheme per word ratio being polysynthetic, meaning it has an extremely high morpheme per word ratio and an entire sentence, maybe a single word, 
especially since the object noun can be incorporated inside the verb. So if we want to say something like, I wash a car for him or her, this is a very long word, all one word that says all of this. So if we break it down, we have Nagazi big idaban etamawa. I wash, we've got a little epithetic I. We've got, this is the noun for car, just put right inside the verb. Then we've got something that marks it as an animate and transitive verb, epithetic T. We've got something that marks it now as a transitive animate verb. And then we have our directional morphology, which is very cool, but we're not gonna talk about that today. So I have this quote from Corbett, who literally wrote the book on grammatical gender. It's called Gender. And he says, thus there is a correlation between language type and the presence of classifiers or gender. And this correlation is exactly as we would expect. It suggests that the two systems may perform similar roles in languages of different morphological types, but the correlation is far from absolute. Exceptionally, a language can have both gender and classifiers. So this is what we find in Ojibwe. So now we can ask, uh, now that we have like a good idea of what noun categorization is, what is grammatical gender specifically? So in a grammatical gender system, every noun is assigned a gender value, every single one. This gender value is inherent to the noun and gender is thus differentiated from other features such as number and case, which may take multiple values per noun. The number of gender values in a given gender system ranges from two to four, depending on whether you want to lump noun classes in there, then you could get somewhere from like two to eight, nine, 10, something like that. Um, but if you're just looking at grammatical gender, it's usually a lower number. We won't get into that uh, argument right here. Um, so gender is defined by morphosyntactic agreement and associated elements outside of the noun. In other words, other parts of speech associated with the noun change their form to match the gender value of the noun. What does that look like? Here's an example from Spanish. Uh, lots of people have familiarity with this language. El perro mimado, the pampered dog. So perro is dog, that's the noun. That's called the controller of agreement. And the other parts of speech, such as the demonstrative over here, el, or the adjective over here, mimado, those are called the targets of agreement. So the noun stays the same, the demonstrative and the uh, adjective change their form. But we really need to see what uh, a feminine example would look like so we can see the difference. So here we have la rata mimada. Here we have rata, which is the noun. And instead of having l as the demonstrative, we now have la, or the article rather. Um, and instead of mimado, we now have mimada. So we can very clearly see, depending on whether the noun is masculine or feminine, we have different forms of, of associated words. This is a mouse in a cup. It's very cute. I had fun doing the pictures for this. Okay, so the term gender comes from the Latin word meaning, uh, Latin word genus meaning kind or sort, and it doesn't actually have anything to do with biological sex. So try to put that out of your mind. Examples of gender value labels include things like masculine, feminine, neuter. These are extremely common in Indo-European languages. And in, in fact, in all of the world's languages that have grammatical gender, they are often based, uh, the gender system is often based on biological sex. But we can also have categories like rational, which is humans and gods, or um, like in Locke, a Northeast Caucasian language, they simply use Roman numerals. In Ojibwe, nouns fall into two gender values, which we commonly label, label animate and inanimate. So if you remember from one of the beginning slides, it's because animates, things that have, sorry, nouns that have animate meanings are in the animate category. Nouns that have inanimate meanings are in the inanimate category, usually. So within the noun phrase, plural marking agrees in gender. And outside the noun phrase, demonstratives and verbs agree in gender. So if you remember when we went back to the definition of agreement, we don't really care about agreement inside the noun phrase. It's really outside the noun phrase that is relevant for grammatical gender. So here we have an example of gender agreement in Ojibwe. Well, this is inside the noun phrase. Um, in seven, we have the animate singular, jigak, skunk, 
And then in B, 7B, we have Jigakwag skunks. In 8A, we have a dopamine table, the inanimate singular. And then in 8B, we have the inanimate plural, a dopamine. So we can see that um, in the plural form, there's different plural markers. This is not enough for speakers. Uh, this is not enough psychological uh, input for speakers. They need to know the animacy of the noun so that they can produce these plural endings and other kinds of agreement. So um, we'll come back to that. Here is a sentence. I look at that skunk. And we can see that we have a particular form of the demonstrative over here. And we also have a particular verbal ending over here in pink. And then the inanimate sentences, iiwe adopwin niganawa abandon. I look at that table and we can see again, just like in Spanish, we have a different form for the demonstrative and a different form for the verbal ending here. So we all get what grammatical gender is. It's defined by agreement and associated uh, words, associated parts of speech. How do speakers know the gender of a noun? Speakers must know the gender of nouns to form sentences. This knowledge is vital to fluency. And gender assignment is the often unconscious method by which speakers allot nouns to different gender values within a language. So gender assignment may be based on the meaning of the noun. This is called semantic assignment. Or it could be based on the phonological form of the noun called formal assignment. That's what we saw in Spanish. So. Um, all gender systems use meaning at least a little bit to determine gender assignment. So we have here like a continuum between semantic assignment and formal assignment. And what these red X's over here are telling us is that there is absolutely no language on earth that has purely formal assignment. They all use semantics a little bit. They all have a core of nouns that are assigned semantically. They may also be marked by phonology, but there is semantic assignment present in every gender system. So uh, predominantly semantic assignment is found in Algonquian, Dravidian, Northeast Caucasian, and Australian languages, Halkomelem, which is Salish, and Zande, spoken in the Niger, or which is in the Niger Congo family. And we have predominantly formal assignment in the Germanic, Romance, Bantu, Kru, and Slavic languages. Also Hausa, which is Chadic, uh, Yimas, and Kafar. Okay. So um, over the years, researchers have taken different perspectives on the role of meaning and assignment. It was once assumed that gender assignment was overwhelmingly based on phonological form and meaning was pretty much arbitrary. They're like, it's there, but it doesn't really matter. If assignment was, or if semantic assignment was relevant for a given system, it had to be very, very simple, consisting of one single core distinction. For example, only biological sex, only animacy, only humanness, stuff like that. But we come into a bit of um, a philosophical linguistic argument here. Um, we have Greenberg on the right-hand side over there, Joseph Greenberg who thought that any exceptions to assignment uh, to the semantic core meant that meaning was irrelevant to assignment and that assignment was then arbitrary. Speakers simply memorized the gender value of a bunch of different nouns. That was his argument. And then we have Irving Hollowell over here, and he countered that exceptions to outsiders are not actually exceptions for speakers once the cultural significance of the exceptions are taken into account, okay? So over here, uh, Greenberg is saying, if we cannot explain the assignment of every single noun from one poor semantic distinction, then meaning is arbitrary to the system. Everything is memorized. And we have Hollowell over here who said, all these exceptions are not actually exceptions once you take into account the worldview of the speakers. Hallowell's position was adopted by Darnell and Vanek for Cree, Black and Black Rogers for Ojibwe, and Strauss and Brightman for Cheyenne. And the single semantic uh, core of Algonquian gender that they proposed, instead of animacy, they said it's actually power. 
So all animate reference have power, obviously, but some inanimate reference can also have power. So that was how they proposed to explain away all the exceptions, all of the nouns with inanimate meanings that we find in the animate category. But these analyses ended up being rather unsatisfactory since not all culturally significant items are animate. So really sacred items, the nouns that denote them, they're just in the inanimate category, which kind of flies in the face of this power, uh, power distinction. Um, and these exceptional animates are actually a source of language and dialectal variation. So trying to find one single semantic feature to be able to figure out every noun's assignment is not going to work. So Dahlstrom, Amy Dahlstrom, points out that Greenberg and Hallowell's positions are actually two sides of the same coin. And what she means by that is that both assumed semantic assignment must only consist of a single semantic distinction, such as biological sex or animacy. Her work on Meskwaki was the first of several applications of a modern approach to gender assignment in Algonquian, including Quinn for Penobscot, Penobscot and Goddard for Algonquian languages generally. These three studies outline not just one core semantic motivation for assignment, but multiple motivations. So despite advances in our understanding of meaning and gender assignment, researchers outside of the subfield um, of noun categorization may still discount its role. So the prominence of meaning in the gender assignment of Algonquian languages had led to claims that it is not a real gender system, but something else. Uh, it's been claimed that it's more like a count mass distinction based on some field work with um, Halko Malam Salish, uh, but we're not gonna get into that today. You can ask me about it in the question and answer period if you like. So now we're going to ask ourselves, what is class? what are classifiers? These are words or parts of words that add or highlight some meaning about the noun and may co-occur with that noun. So I have an example here from Maya, Yucatec Maya. And we have all of these um, three different examples have the exact same noun. That's what we see highlighted in yellow here, banana. They all have the numeral one that we see over here. But what differs between the three of them is the classifier. So in Maya, um, the noun banana is actually has a meaning that's very broad. We might consider it somewhat unspecified. And the classifiers are adding or highlighting some meaning. In this case, they're adding meaning. So if we say, if we use a classifier for one dimensional plus banana, that gets us one banana fruit. If we have the classifier for two dimensional plus banana, that gets us a banana leaf. And if we have the classifier for planted plus banana, that gets us one banana tree. There are multiple types of classifiers throughout the world's languages. The current typology of classifiers relies on the um, part, of sweet, part of speech to which the classifier is closest or attached. So for example, classifiers adjacent to nouns are called noun classifiers. Classifiers occurring with verbs are verbal classifiers. Classifiers occurring with numerals are numeral classifiers. This typological framework helps describe multiple kinds of classifiers within a single language, as well as across the world's languages. So Ojibwe has both verbal and numeral classifiers. Within the numeral classifiers, there are also two types, mensural and sortal. Um, so we are going to focus on the numeral classifiers today, and we are also going to focus on the sortal numeral classifiers. So what are these two different types? Here's a table of a sampling of mensural classifiers in Ojibwe. So these are measurements, mensural meaning measurement. So things like Ngodabagan uh, Gadagigan, one yard of fabric. Uh, we also have things like inch, foot, arm span, pailful, boatful, bagful. There's tons of mensural classifiers and they are used a lot. These are our traditional five sortal classifiers. There's about five. So we have um, Bejigweg Wabuyan, one sheet like blanket. Uh, sorry, excuse me. So this Bejigwa is the numeral, it means one. And then in the bolded, you'll see the classifier. And then some of these occur with overt nouns. So Bejigweg Wabuyan, one sheet like blanket. Bejigwabig Nabakwagan, one string like necklace. Bejigwachig Nitigons, one stick like small stick. Bejigwa Wabik, one mineral dollar 
We'll talk about why that is not occurring with a noun. Um, it does traditionally, but currently it doesn't work like that. Uh, but we also have lastly, Bejigwa, Minag, Sabab, one berry-like ball of yarn. So there are five sortal classifiers. This is what we're really interested in to explain these exceptional animates. So the distinction between sortal and mensural classifiers matters beyond semantics and into the grammar of some languages. In Ojibwe, different root forms of the numeral for one are used with sortal and mensural classifiers. And both forms of one are traceable to Proto-Algonquian. So mensural classifiers are used with Ningodwa and sortal classifiers are used with Bejigwa. And I'll just go back so you can see these are the sortal ones. Um, instead of being measurements, these are typically like physical properties of the reference. So things like material, shape, size, flexibility, um, sometimes function. And then if we go back here to the mensural ones, these all occur with, ning occur with ningo or ningodo. So this is a real distinction in the language between these two kinds of numeral classifiers. So now we get to the fun part. <laughs> what is the link between gender and classifiers? To restate the proposal from the beginning, nouns are assigned to the animate gender value when they have meanings of animate reference, totally expected, or with meanings of inanimate reference that are semantically compatible with the set of sortal classifiers and nouns associated through semantic extension. So what we're gonna see next is a series of diagrams that I hope will help to um, paint the picture of what this looks like. In the center here, we have the motivation for assignment to the animate category. Every single noun that you're about to see in these diagrams is in the animate category, okay? So here we have kind of like the core, the core set of nouns, humans and animals, okay? So things like ikwe, woman, man, anini, abinuji, child, um, jibe, spirit, ghost, animals down here, jishib. But we also have imitation of animates included in this category. So, um, oh boy. Screen sharing is covering some stuff, but hopefully, um, well, is there any way to not show that? Okay, you know what, I'll just go on and hopefully it won't, won't be too much of a trouble. Um, so we have um, names for playing cards over here that, that are basically um, polysemous with some other nouns. So we have ikwe woman means Sorry, ikwe means woman, but also it's used for queen card. Uh, Ogama chief is also used for the king card. And we have soldier, which is also used for the jack card, shimaganish. And then we have things up here at the top. Um, Odomino wagon is a doll. So the inanimate form of Odomino wagon is simply toy. Um, and we have from things like spirit, sacred story, myth, we get some semantic extension to things like star, anang, uh, gijig, heaven sky, Jesus, sun or moon. And so because these um, celestial bodies are associated with mythological persons, um, they come to fall under the imitation of animateness motivation. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say over here, we also have things like um, from fish, we get things like a fish decoy, okay, uh, um, or like a duck decoy, which is also in the animate category from imitation of animateness. So I mentioned these playing cards. So we have things like queen card, king card, deck card. Then we get the semantic extension to all kinds of playing cards being in the animate category. So things like the regular term for a playing card, a tadawin, or uh, the different kinds of suits or the different like numbered cards, all, all playing cards are in the animate category. There's also something to be said for the fact that playing cards were introduced through uh, like the, the colonizers coming over. That wasn't a, a normal thing that would have been a part of Ojibwe culture. So it's kind of notable that these playing cards, people were using them and then we get the semantic extension associated with them. Okay, next we have measurements of time. So the word gijig means heaven or sky. It's also used for measurements of days. Similarly, uh, 
Jesus, which is sun or moon, is also used as measurements for months. And um, baboon, which is itself, um, it has the meaning of winter. It is not an independent noun. It is part of its uh, bound morpheme, but it also has the meaning for year. So we get an extension to something like a clock or a watch uh, that is also in the animate category. So now from this, we also get an extension to all kinds of wintertime things being in the animate category. So something like snow, gone, snowshoe again, um, mikwam, ice, all in the animate category, even something like a glove or a mitten, minja kawan. And now we have all kinds of mittens and gloves being in the animate category by semantic extension. So uh, even things that have nothing to do with snow, so an oven mint, a pagaku apabikanang. And interestingly, the inanimate form of this means um, not an oven mitt, but uh, what do you call the flat one? I'm having a blank. Like a hot pad. Pot holder. Yeah, something like that. The flat one that's not a mitten. Um, okay, so we can see this last one quite extensive because this is the core of the gender system. This next one is a little more sparse. So at the center, we have eag or egg, meaning sheet-like. Um, really, uh, IIG is the form of the classifier, meaning sheet-like. But sometimes you get um, phonological change to egg just based on what, what is around it. So it's phonologically conditioned. So we have things like hides, uh, amikwayan, beaver hide, tanned hide, asekan all kinds of hides, also things like bark, wanagek, that are traditional, they're sheet-like. Interestingly, this also accounts for drums because um, hides are used to make drums. So we get a semantic extension to drums. That's it for that one. It's not too complicated. Um, this next one here, this is a classifier abig for string-like. And we have all kinds of things that are made with string. So we've got something like a net, a sab, thread, a sababis, a nettle, which is a plant traditionally used to make strings, um, fibers and threads. Um, we also have stuff like scarf, gijopizan, and we have things like spruce roots, wadab, which are also used for threads. Um, next, this also gets us sewing implements, like a thimble or a sewing machine which is cut off, but it's up there. Um, I will also say, so there are three categories of nouns that are mixed, that have mixed assignment. Some are animate and some are inanimate in Ojibwe. And that includes food, plants, and body parts. So we can see that this gets us some of the plants. And this next sort of classifier in the middle here is atig, which has the meaning of stick-like. This is also gonna get us some more plants and it's gonna get us some body parts and it's gonna get us some food. So around the center here, uh, up on the top, we have all kinds of trees. Mitig is the base word for tree. Um, then we have things like pen or pencil or drumstick, dawayaganak, um, a wild rice knocker, which is like a long stick. Um, we also have something like a carrot, okadak. And then we get a little semantic extension to beat. And if you take a look at the form of the word, it's actually red, beet, red carrot. So the word for beet is a red carrot. So in a lot of these semantic extensions where it's just a single noun that is getting put into the animate assignment based on its relation to something else, you can see a derivational relationship with the words. Um, so we also have lots of body parts down here on the bottom, uh, something like nipigay, my rib, uh, feather, miguan, porcupine quill, gawe. Actually, a feather took me a long time to realize how this assignment was working. And somebody said to me, well, if you take away the soft part, it looks like a quill. And I thought, oh, that makes complete sense. So, oops, there we have it. Um, we've also got something like my claw or my nail, nishkant, and that will get us um, its scale of a fish, onaga ion. So a fish scale, Really, if you look at your fingernail, it's in the same shape. So you can kind of see how that relation works out there. 
And then we also get something like a snake rattle, Zhi Guan, because a snake rattle, if you look at it, it looks like it's built up of lots of little scales. Okay, so the next classifier we have here is a BIC, which has the meaning of mineral. So we have um, this is things like uh, made out of metal, stone, glass, uh, clay, things like that. So we have on the side here, um, lots of money, a dime, uh, a nickel, a bita junians. We have stones and rocks down here, a sin, pipestone, pargana sin, um, a boulder, a biquasin. And then up on the top there, we have metal containers for water. So traditionally things like birch bark baskets would be used to contain water. So again, when colonization happened, there's this introduction of more metal that can be used to make metal containers for water. So all of these things get put in the animate category because they're made of metal and they're kind of this like novel thing. So most importantly, we have a kick, which is a kettle or a pot. We also get things like a tolban, a trough, sink or vat, and an engine or a motor, mayaji bizod, which, you know, if you're not um, an engineer or mechanically inclined, water, or not water, but um, fluid goes through the, the engine. Okay, so next, this also gets us money. So something like a dollar, bejigwabik, you can even see uh, the same form of the classifiers in the noun, or it's even extended to things like paper money, which are not made of a mineral material, but now all kinds of money are in the animate category. Next, we get things like pipes. So like a stone pipe, a red pipe, just the regular word for a pipe, opragan, because they're made of stone. Then we get tobacco products, which are put into pipes. We have the semantic extension to tobacco, asema. Um, and then you even get something like a medicine bag, which would contain tobacco within it. Mide uh, wayan, also being in the animate category. Okay, this next one is very busy. I hope you're ready for this. So this is the classifier minog, which has the meaning of very like. This is gonna get us a lot of food. It's gonna get us beads and some body parts and some other stuff. So if we start out on the top, we have corn, mandamin, has the meaning of like, it can be an ear of corn or it can be the kernel of corn, which is very berry like looking. We also have raspberry, miscomen. Interestingly, in the Strauss and Bright, um, so going back to Joseph Greenberg and Irvin Hollowell's kind of headbutting that was going on, the people who agreed with Irving Hollowell, one of the papers that came out of that was Strauss and Brightman's paper titled The Implacable Raspberry. And so Greenberg actually said, because raspberry is in the animate category and strawberry is not, unless we see that um, the Anishinaabe have shrines to the raspberry or somehow like elevate this, uh, then I don't really buy the fact that grammatical gender can be, can be assigned by power, sort of. Um, so basically he was saying, because we don't know what the difference is between raspberry and strawberry, because they're treated the same by the people, then we can't necessarily say that Ojibwe people think that the raspberry is somehow animated or more special than a strawberry. But what I think is going on here is that raspberries are round in shape and strawberries are shaped like hearts. They have little pointed bottoms. And the word in Ojibwe um, for strawberry, odemen, is actually heartberry. So we also we have all kinds of food over here. Um, apple, nishimen, which you can see this M-I-N you will see on the ends of lots of these words is a different form of the morpheme that, that means berry. Um, so we've got all kinds of food over here. Going over here, we have things like beads, monodominance, uh, shells or pearls, negus. And then we get extensions to items of beadwork or like a rosary. And then moving over to the left side here, we start to get into body parts. So the body parts that are in the animate category are things that have this berry-like shape. Up on the top there, ninishiwag, my testicles. Definitely can see the shape resemblance there. Something like my knee might not be so obvious, but if you think about the 3D space that the knee encapsulates, 
it is small round, small and round. You have a knee cap. Um, also things like my, my lymph node, Minishk. Interestingly, also my nostril. Um, I saw it said on a Facebook comment once that we will never know why snot, which we can see through semantic extension is also in the animate category. People have said, we'll never know why snot is animate, but phlegm is not. And I think it has to do with the shape and its relation to the nostril, whereas phlegm is in your throat, which is not very shaped. Um, one other interesting thing to point out here is this um, caster sac, Wienzena. So beavers have caster sacs uh, and they, they look like testicles. They were actually thought to be testicles at one point in time, but we now know that they hold fat and they help secrete scent and they were very highly prized for those vanilla-like scent um, uh, applications, sometimes used in perfume or food or things like that. Um, but we also, so we get an extension to beaver fat, amico weenin, which is in the animate category. All other kinds of fat are not in the animate category. Okay. Another big group of body parts that are in the animate category are reproductive organs we can see up here. So um, from testicles, we get things like uh, my vulva, nicodin, or my lap in jingguan being in the animate category. Uh, I can't even remember what that top one is. Underpants, thank you. Um, and then also the word for pants uh, being in the animate category by semantic extension. And then from corn, we get all kinds of corn products being in the animate category. So things like cornmeal, bisabujigan, or um, corn bread, bisabujigan bakwejigan, or that's corn soup, bisabujigan abo. And then you get semantic extension from all kinds of corn products, which would have been the traditional grain being used to things made of wheat. Um, and that was also something that was introduced with colonization. So we have things like pie, betusi uh, jigan, excuse me, um, bakwe jigan, bread. I will call your attention up here to um, sugar cone, the shishiguans, which is actually literally a little snake rattle. So this, um, this long A and S is the diminutive. And then we also have sourdough, which is a type of bread. Um, and I will also call your attention to pickle way up at the top there. We see the same thing. So you see um, sourdough, ziwisijigan, and pickle is ziwisijigan. So it also has that diminutive ending. So a pickle is literally a little sourdough. Again, we can see a derivational relationship between the words that have this semantic extension. Okay. That one's pretty full. Now we get into the further considerations, the complicating factors. So some nouns may have more than one potential semantic motivation for assignment to the animate gender. For example, metigwagim, um, ski, could be animate through association with snow or the classifier atik. I don't really see this as a downside to the analysis. I would just say the more motivation that you have, the more likely it is that that noun's gonna be assigned to the animate category. We also have something like um, jishiguans, sugar cones could be animate through association with grain products, which is how I organized it back here. But it could also be animate through association with a snake rattle. So when I put snake rattle up here, I could have had a semantic extension to uh, a little sugar cone. The next thing to talk about is the um, taxonomic effect. So if you are a speaker of the language or you have some, you're a, a language learner, you might be wondering, there are some things, some nouns that are compatible with these sort of classifiers, but are not animate. So this is something that needs to be dealt with. This is something that needs to be addressed. And for at least some of them, it seems like uh, what is going on is a bit of taxonomy. So, to take a step back, we know that the origin of classifier forms often comes from independent nouns. So it's been well established that mean blueberry is the origin of the classifier minog. Um, 
It's also well established that metic stick is the origin of the classifier for stick like things. These other ones up here, a chob bowstring for string like and uh, tar or pitch begiwa for mineral. Those are my educated guesses. Um, and I haven't come up with anything for egg or egg yet. As you can imagine, it's very small. <laughs> so there could be a lot of different things. But the connection that I think is happening here is that these, um, these nouns that serve as potential uh, lexical origins for the classifiers could also be the name of the category, so the hypernym. Um, and then, so these would be inanimate. So blueberry is actually inanimate in the language, even though it's totally compatible with the sort of classifier for berry-like, because it kind of like names the category, it is inanimate. And all these other things, uh, apple, mishimin, corn, mandamin, grape, majumin, those are animate. So these are instances of the category, hyponyms. And it's completely normal for something to be both a hypernym and a hyponym. So a blueberry, names the category is also an instance of the category. Um, when people talk about how these naming of the categories, how that comes about, it's because blueberry is like the most common or frequent use of berries. It's the most common instantiation, I will say. So aside from these uh, nouns that may possibly be like the lexical origin, and I'll say like all of these are inanimate, even though they are compatible with these classifiers. There are some other nouns that don't seem to serve as a source for the, the classifiers, but they are still inanimate because they name a category. So for example, um, if we did one for, for um, sheet-like things, I could have um, Boschwegen, which is just the general term for a hide up here, and then other types of hides, like a bear hide or a squirrel hide or a beaver hide are all gonna be animate. Okay, we're nearing the end here. Um, taxonomy is um, not only relevant for the Ojibwe system of grammatical gender, but it's found in other languages too. So um, Zubin and Kopke did this paper about German, and it seems like taxonomy is also relevant for gender assignment in German. So you get general, uh, general nouns like thing, being in the, I think the neuter category, and then instances of that are in the masculine or the feminine. And I did say that we would talk about dialectal variation. So it's true that some nouns show variation in assignment across different communities of speakers. My answer for this is that there's different conventionalization of uh, semantic extension. So I showed you guys the animate G with Sijigan, Sijigan's pickle, but, and that's in the Southwest variety, but in Milwax, someone also provided the word, Jiwi de Pabekobens, excuse me, Jiwi de Pabekobens. And that actually means, so the Jiwi uh, part has the meaning of sweet or sour. The next part has the meaning of cucumber. So this word is composed differently in a different community. You could call it a little sourdough or you could call it a sour cucumber. And remember, so this is a semantic extension that's, it's basically like a one-off. It didn't lead to other pickle-like things forming its own category. Um, it's just way off on the periphery up there. So there's going to be some variation in how communities of speakers apply semantic extension. So in this example, this community of speakers, mainly in the Southwestern variety, call the pickle a little sourdough, and then you get a semantic extension, so pickle is animate. But in another, cat or in another community, they didn't do things the same way, and they didn't have that semantic extension. So that's gonna account for some of the variation. So I'm making a prediction that the one-off semantic extensions that are around the periphery are gonna be more likely to show variation. And that does seem to be what we find. Um, next, um, I mentioned earlier when we were talking about mensural classifiers, those are the classifiers that um, have meanings of measurements. 
there's tons of those and they're used all over the place very widely. But the sortal classifier system is actually not very much in use. I say it's like fading from use. And when you combine this with the very productive semantic assignment that we see in the grammatical gender system, there's gonna be regularization happening. So for example, um, we have an inanimate form for curtains, gabiga igan, which is in the Southwestern variety. Um, you did not see curtains in the example because all of the uh, all of the, the nouns that we referenced were, were mainly from the Southwestern variety. And this is inanimate. So you would not have seen it in the diagrams. But in the Eastern and Ottawa varieties, we have Wasechiganigan, which also means curtains. And that's animate. So these very clearly are compatible with sheet like things. But one community decided that they would be inanimate, and another decided it would be animate. And I think this is because by the time curtains were a thing, the sortal classifiers and the motivation for from sortal classifiers in the grammatical gender system, it's not salient. So you're gonna have some different, uh, some different assignments showing up. Um, and this is uh, kind of to add to a piece of, it's a piece of evidence for the fading of the sortal classifier system. So when I showed you guys the list of the sortal classifiers, all five of them, they all occurred with an overt noun except this one, abic, meaning mineral. So the classifier abic mineral does not function as a sortal classifier in the language anymore. It has become lexicalized as the morpheme for dollar. So if I said bejigwabic, um, that doesn't mean one something mineral, it means one dollar. So um, when I was doing my field work, speakers rejected its use with a huge list of nouns that were semantically compatible with this classifier. So things like pot, kettle, doorknob, window pane, glass boulder, belt buckle, stove, none of it was compatible. Um, and Grinewald, who basically wrote the typology of classifiers, says a narrowing of semantics may be indicative of the fading of a classifier system. So we know that Abic functioned as a sort of classifier because we have old grammars to refer to, but it's not how speakers use it nowadays. Okay. This is also just another point to add that um, sort of classifiers. So these are the columns that I showed in the beginning, animate meaning animate gender, inanimate meaning inanimate gender, inanimate meaning animate gender. I bring this up to say that sort of classifiers are incompatible with anything in this category. Anything that is in the animate category, but is actually notionally animate cannot be used with a classifier. And this is interesting because classifiers show a lot of variation. It's not like uh, grammatical gender where every noun has a gender value. In classifier systems, some nouns simply do not occur with any classifier. So all of these animate nouns do not occur with any classifier. But in Arapaho, we have some very interesting work being done by um, James Andrew Powell at the University of Colorado Boulder. And his speakers can use all kinds of classifiers, not his speakers, but the people that he works with, excuse me, they can use all kinds of classifiers with animate, uh, animate nouns, with animate meanings. So that classifier system is very vibrant and is used a lot and does not seem to be fading from use like we see in Ojibwe. So the gender system, on the other hand, has very productive semantic assignment. Certain semantic motivations such as cars, grain products, tobacco, drums, et cetera, are very, very salient for speakers, whereas motivations directly from sortal classifiers such as berry-like or sheet-like are not salient. So in conclusion, by allowing for multiple semantic motivations to account for assignment to the animate gender, namely animacy, compatibility with a set of sortal classifiers, and a small group of semantic extensions there's no need to refer to certain animate nouns as exceptions to semantic assignment or else maintain that everything in the animate gender must be alive. Variation in assignment is explained by different applications of semantic extension across dialects and diachronic changes due to the loss of saliency and the semantic motivation from sortal classifiers, as well as regularization of the productive semantics of gender assignment. That's it. Thank you very much.
I do have a couple of additional slides here if anybody wants to ask me how to constrain semantic extension. What about mushrooms or what about cars? Just some ideas, but because um, <laughs> I couldn't talk about everything. Martin. Um, so if you exclude the colonial era things, mm -hmm. so if you look on your pre-colonial stuff, how many layers of extension do you have? So are those only, are they restricted to sort of newer things or do they exist in pre-colonial things to the same extent? For semantic extension. Um, so with the animate category, we do have some layers of semantic extension. For example, things like imitation of animateness, um, measurements of time, winter, uh, gloves, would all be things not having to do with colonial introduction of new things. It, it does seem to be that um, novel items are, are more likely if they form like a group and you can do some kind of semantic extension, it does seem that those are more likely to stand out to speakers as something that's like special. And so they might get put in the animate category for that kind of reasoning too. So like I said, the motivation from, motivation from animate, this is definitely there, but from the sort of classifiers, not so much. And one of the things that people will say very generally is like, well, if something is special, it might get put in the animate category, but that doesn't really explain how that happens because not all special things are in the animate category. Like we said, part of the reason that power doesn't work um, as a, a single motivation is because there are things that are very special, like a sacred pack um, that aren't in the animate category. So I'm not sure as far as like layers, um, it kind of depends like which classifier you're looking at. So if we looked at um, this one, there's maybe at most like one single layer of semantic extension. Um, and I think the same, so this one, we have one layer of semantic extension. Same thing here, one layer. Um, a tick doesn't, possibly doesn't have any. Um, a BIC, one layer of semantic extension. The only thing that's, um, so actually two layers here because we've got from stone to pipe to tobacco. And then medicine bag is kind of like a one-off, um, one-off semantic extension. Uh, let's see, Minog. I think this is mostly one or two layers. Yeah, this is also one layer, but then we have like pickle is like the weird third layer that's again a one-off semantic extension. So there's really, there's really not that much semantic extension uh, going on, but. We had a, we looked at the whole Ojibwe people's dictionary and pulled all of the nouns that were in the animate category that had an animate reference. We got about 420 of them and they are all easily explained by this kind of reasoning, by looking at the, the sortal classifiers. And I will just also, I didn't say this in the beginning when I introduced the diagrams, but there's no, obviously I couldn't include all 420 nouns in these diagrams, but anything that was not easily explained, something like a pickle or um, a, a, a snake rattle, all of those are in the diagrams. Like there's a bajillion different kinds of trees. I didn't put all the trees in here. The only nouns that were left out were things that were obviously accounted for. And I had a couple of examples of trees to show, uh, to represent that. But everything that would be a little bit weird, it's in here. So. So I don't think there's too much semantic extension, but um, definitely a relevant question. I hope that answered it. I think there's one or two layers, yeah, at most. I'm 
Um, okay, so this is from Ezra. He says, there seems to be a connection here with iconicity. There are many possible semantic extensions, but only some are conventionalized, realized. Do you have a sense diachronically of the process whereby these extensions occur? And also, I'm interested in the slide on constraints on extensions. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to go there anyway. So good. I'm glad you're interested. Um, so as uh, Martin brought up, definitely new items, like novel items that would have been introduced at the time of colonization, that does seem to be something that will kind of tip it towards, uh, tip the group towards being a candidate for semantic extension. Um, Gosh, who made all these slides? Okay, um, so this is how can we constrain semantic extension and kind of re related to the question, I say that only those that resonate with or make sense to speakers will become conventionalized. So I imagine something like pickle um, maybe might've been like a newer thing. Like we see that it was derivationally related to the word for sourdough, which definitely would not have been around if people were only eating corn and making things from corn. So again, that's like a novel thing. Um, I don't have a good sense other than the motivation from things being novel or special at the time of uh, being introduced at col uh, during colonization. I think that's a very obvious reason why things would form a semantic extension and be in the animate category. Um, like I said, um, metal containers for water, but that was also kind of a new thing. Yeah, it really seems like novel items introduced during the time of colonization were prime candidates for this kind of semantic extension, um, which makes sense because if you have new nouns introduced into the language, they're gonna have to receive a gender value in some way. And some of them might've been categorized simply based on whether they were animate or inanimate and others because these possible semantic extensions and because they were somehow special, they got put in the animate category. Um, Further things that we can say about how to constrain semantic extension is that cross-linguistically, many of the extensions shown here are common. For example, celestial bodies are personified in mythological stories and become categorized with humans and animates. Um, also, like if you do have a gender system where animacy is relevant, then imitation of animacy will also be in there. So that's pretty common. So even though the animate, um, the diagram showing all of the motivation from animacy seemed pretty full, none of what was going on there is really strange if we look at gender systems across the world that have semantic assignment and have semantic extension which is present um, and then lastly i would say the more semantic extensions there are the more opaque the assignment mechanism is to speakers and the harder it is to maintain which is why we get regularization and instead of motivation from the sort of classifiers being salient people think in terms of like groups of things like cars, petals, beads, feathers, all that stuff that I, that I said earlier when I had like this huge disparate group of nouns and how can we put all of these together in the animate category? So I, I don't know if there's a follow-up from that person, but I hope that that answers their question. <laughs> Thank you. interesting topic and I agree with you that the alternative uh, classifiers are just fine. Um, I want to give you some examples in Chinese. So the confusion with classifiers are quite easy to find across different dialects. So fish could be a tail of fish as classifier or a stripe of a fish, it's longish shape. Yeah. So the classifiers would be stripe or tail? Yeah. Okay. And different I, dialects will apply different They use different versions. And then if you hear all different versions, then you could just randomly pick one, depending on who you're talking to. 
And Chinese is an isolating language, so classifiers are widely used. Um, but then gender got into the language quite recently, um, probably artificially so. So for people, there is he, she, and it mm -hmm. for inanimate. And then uh, they has a plural male versus female. Only in writing, the pronunciation is the same. Okay. Uh, so once you got used to it, um, you, you, you don't really make mistakes with that. Um, so most people already got used to it. But when you speak English, the confusion comes back. And the he, she is a major uh, English error Chinese speakers make. Um, they, of course, there's English doesn't distinguish them. But, so I, I just don't know um, how this gender could have got into the language. Um, probably uh, it's early 19, uh, early 20th century when the Chinese scholars or government tried to modernize the language. Because you just can't have a language if you don't distinguish people's genders, right? <laughs> well, you do notice that. So I guess that's the reason why uh, it got into writing very quickly. Um, there are actually different degrees of recommendation. Some people even use you with a gender, male you and a female you. And that didn't really quite get into the widespread use yet. Um, you have to be fast to do that because you're talking directly with somebody, right? Well, the, the spoken language is the same. It's only okay. when you write. Uh, yeah, so all the three, you, uh, he, she, it, pronounced the same way. Historically, there is no distinction. But people pick it up. So in writing, rarely you make a mistake like that. That's interesting that the distinction is in the writing and not in the spoken language. Yeah, I guess there is, you know, it all relies on conceptual distinctions people clearly make. So um, it's, I, I don't think there is a typological language that really causes a difference. It really depending on. So I, I also feel that the gender classifiers are decreasing over the years um, because all the dialects mix together and only the common ones survive when you want to talk to people who are from different dialect areas. Um, so there is gen generic one you can always use for anything. Um, then if you want to be fancy, you can use more individual ones, uh, like a tail of fish, for example, shows you have more knowledge of the language. You're a better speaker. I would say that Chinese doesn't, even though it, it has some encoding of gender, the biological sex, it doesn't have grammatical gender, as we've talked about today, that is based on agreement with other parts of speech. No, there is no agreement. Yeah. So like English has the same thing. We have gendered pronouns, but we don't have grammatical gender because there's no agreement with adjectives or verbs or anything like that. Agreement is really hard to introduce and people <laughs> dropping agreements. That's a trend. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Gender assignment. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually aware of any kind of asymmetries like that right now, but that is, um, that's really interesting to think about. I'm going to make a note of it.
Yes. I would say that it happened at the same time. So um, metig, if it's inanimate, is the stick, which is like naming the category of stick-like things. And if metig is animate, then it's a tree. And there are actually, um, I've done some work looking at pairs like this, where the nouns, there's two different nouns. They have the exact same form, but they have different gender assignments and different but related meanings. Um, and I, because there are nouns that name categories that are inanimate, but are not necessarily a lexical source for the classifier origin, I don't want to make too strong a claim about the timing that these kinds of things happen. But I would say that metic as tree and metic as stick would have been a simultaneous development. Um, and then it just so happens to be that because stick is stick like and that's naming the category it bears more of a resemblance to what the classifier ended up being. And so that one is inanimate, whereas tree is not. Does that, is that satisfactory? Well, I think it is, it is from the classifier, but it's more like an instance of a stick-like thing as opposed to being the most stick-like thing, which is a stick. Um, but I don't want to make any, I, I'm not necessarily saying that metic as a stick came first before tree. I think that that would have happened at the same time. Thank you for your question. Okay. One more, one more. <laughs> Am I audible? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so thank you. I was wondering um, if any research has been done on um, maybe, how do I put it? Um, language acquisition uh, of these classifiers in Ojibwe and related languages. I know some research has been done with Mandarin and Japanese on the topic, but um, more specifically, I was wondering if um, anyone has done like a, a WUG test-ish uh, experiment with these classifiers, giving them, uh, giving native speakers nonce words and um, seeing how they would count them, uh, what classifiers they would use to count them. Not yet. But if you come here, we could work on such a project together. <laughs> um, generally, endangered languages really lag behind in those kinds of studies, studies done with actual people, speakers. Um, I do know somebody who is now at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who does language acquisition with Cree children, but I haven't yet gotten him to do classifier stuff, so we'll see. But yeah, I would something I would like to do in the future is to do that kind of thing with adult speakers and give them nonsense objects um, and see how they categorize them. I think that would be very interesting. It would be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. I hope to see you at the dinner.